Scott. Good morning, friends. I encourage you to keep those Bibles open to Psalm 130 as we look at this uh, beautiful psalm together. And uh, as we get started, I just want to start by saying thank you to the families who have participated in our Advent candle readings uh, this year so far. Uh, lighting a candle and, and at Advent, each, each Sunday of Advent, it's an old, old tradition stretching clear back to the 1600s by some accounts. Uh, it's a relatively new uh, experience for our gathered worship here at Stonebridge, uh, but I hope you've found it meaningful. Uh, I hope it's been a meaningful uh, addition to our worship because thinking about Christmas in terms of Advent really helps us remember just what exactly this season is about, right? So joy, yes. Uh, Happiness and cheer, sure. Uh, The birth of Jesus, absolutely. But before all of that is waiting. Waiting, longing, preparing, expecting, and then receiving and rejoicing. And that's the spirit, the posture, really, of Advent. For a long time, I always just kind of thought the words Advent and Christmas were interchangeable. And and we certainly use them that way a lot, right? Uh, But Advent is more specific as a word. Uh, As Dean said at the beginning of the service, the word itself means coming, arrival. It's, It's that time where we prepare for the coming, for the arrival of Christ our King in His incarnation, and it's a reminder that He is coming again to make all things new. So we remember the first Advent as we wait for the second Advent. And and so it's fitting for us as we are waiting for Christ's second Advent to kind of rehearse ancient Israel's story of waiting and longing and expecting their king. The darkness of that waiting, the frustration, the fear, the weariness mixed with the, the, the joy and anticipation, the hope and light of God's word, the hope of his great promises, the hopes and fears of all the years. Uh, it's fitting because we feel that, right? We feel that tension, that, that darkness, that weariness ourselves, you know, there, there's a tension because here, you know, here we are, the most wonderful time of the year, right? The, the festive celebrations, the, the beautiful decorations, and yet we all know that not all is right in the world, right? Even in our own families and, and, and relationships, it's a fallen world, and it's been a particularly hard couple of years. But if God was faithful... To Israel in her waiting. If he was faithful to send the one in whom the hopes and fears of all the years are met, then not only can we live in the power and joy of what God has accomplished by sending Christ the first time, we can also live with hope and faithful waiting for him to complete his work when Christ returns in the end. And so what I want to do this morning is to help us enter into that waiting, that longing to remember God's great promises to Israel and to the world and to share in their their expectation and longing to receive and celebrate God's promised king. And I want to do that by kind of stepping into the story of ancient Israel as it's unfolded in a collection of psalms uh, called the Songs of Ascents. So Psalm 130 is is part of this collection. If you've been around Stonebridge for a while, we've looked at different psalms from this collection before, but you'll notice if you look at Psalm 130 again, sometimes in the psalms you see like the small print right above verse 1, and we call that a superscript. And, and above, uh, or right at the beginning of each psalm in 120 through 134, you have the same phrase in the superscript. It reads, a song of ascents. So this is this collection of songs in, in 120 to, 30 to 134. And our best guess is that these were the songs that ancient Israel would sing as they would make their pilgrim journey up to Jerusalem 
to worship. Uh, that's where you get the language of ascents. They're going up to Jerusalem. So these psalms were kind of like their hymn book for, for the journey or their playlist, if you will. And uh, if you're familiar with the Old Testament or if you're not familiar, either way, it's helpful to remember that Israel was God's chosen people. Among all of the nations, they were the people God chose to be His special people through whom He was going to restore what was broken in the beginning and bring a blessing to all nations of the earth. And to that end, He made them into a great nation. He rescued them from slavery in Egypt. He gave them His law to guide them and to guard them. He gave them a tabernacle, like a a tent where He would make His presence among them so that He might dwell with them. Eventually, he gave them a land. He brought them into a land that he'd promised them. He gave them a king to rule over them on his behalf. And then that, temp, that tabernacle became a temple where he would dwell with them in Jerusalem. And, and so part of Israel's ongoing covenant relationship with God was gathering as a people in Jerusalem Three times a year, they had these three annual festivals you can read about in Deuteronomy 16. They were to go up to Jerusalem to gather as one people before the Lord for worship. And so these were the songs they would sing on that journey. Songs that gave voice to the whole range of emotions and experiences that you would expect being part of taking a a trip in the ancient world. Uh, but also really common to anybody who is pursuing God in any day. The anticipation and hope, the darkness and uncertainty, the fear and danger, the joy and celebration, that whole range of emotion. And, and Psalm 130 begins on a rather, uh, a bit of a dark note. It begins with a cry of desperation. So if you look again at verse, verse 1, verses 1 and 2. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. That sounds pretty serious, right? Uh, the depths, that language of the depths, it's, it's, it's language of a severe trial and utter desperation. It's the picture of being swallowed into the heart of the sea. Uh, Psalm 69 describes it this way. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire. There's no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I mean, one can think of the, the devastation of the flood here back in 08. Or the danger of of being caught in an undertow in the Cedar River, right? The terror and desperation of being pulled down and and swept away. That's the metaphor that the psalmist uses to describe his situation. It's the depths. It's tragic. It's desperate. And so he cries to the Lord. and, And, you know, ancient Israel was no stranger to crisis and desperation, like they no stranger to it, and, and the Psalms of Ascents, uh, songs of Ascents, actually give us several different glimpses into the kinds of trials and, and and tragedies that often encountered ancient Israel in their pursuit of God, uh, from living near Gentiles who who would like nothing more than to make war with God's people in in chapter one twenty, to the danger of simply making a journey in the ancient world in in chapter one twenty one. I lift my eyes to the hills. The, the hills that, that so often hide the robbers and the bandits and all of the, the hazards of this trip, from where does my help come? How, how am I going to actually make it there? Um, to the scorn of the arrogant and the proud in 123, those who would tear them down and take advantage of them, uh, to the affliction of their enemies in 129, those who hate God and his people and would love to knock God off of his throne. Israel knew that they were living their days in a broken and hostile world. And we too know something about that brokenness and and that hostility, right? I mean, we have so much to be thankful for in our lives. But I don't think there's anyone here who is under the, the misconception that everything works the way that it's supposed to, 
right? That, that life is just as it ought to be. We all know that this is a broken world, a fallen place. The New Testament tells us this is not our home, right? We are strangers and exiles surrounded by so many who do not acknowledge the Lord and who would love it if we would turn our backs on Him as well. Uh, A broken world where people still try to tear us down and take advantage of us, sometimes in the name of God. A world where our bodies don't always work the way they're supposed to. Our relationships don't always go the way we intend. Our hearts are often broken and weary. And Christmas, the Christmas season is not immune from any of that, right? Uh, the joy of watching kids open their gifts in December is quickly replaced by the despair of opening January's credit card bill, right? It, it, it's true. Uh, you know, loved ones that we lost in 2021. I mean, some of our holiday gatherings are going to be missing some people, Right? Loved ones we lost in 2021, some of them to COVID, or family members that are no longer speaking to us because of political differences, you know, debates and and arguments over masks and vaccines and all of this stuff that is just ripping us apart. Even in this joyful season, we feel the weariness of this world. I mean, we we are two years into COVID now. And every time we think we're going to turn a corner, we learn a new letter in the Greek alphabet, (laughs) right? Some new variant that comes along and messes everything up all over again. We're weary. We need, we feel the flood, right? We need the Lord to rescue us. But what is the actual flood here in Psalm 130? What is the nature of the crisis in these specific verses? If we keep reading, we see that it's not the affliction of Israel's enemies, as in 120 or or 129, nor is it the danger of the journey in 121 or the scorn of the proud in, in 123. No, actually, Psalm 130 brings us face to face with our greatest problem Yet, In fact, the the greatest problem we face in this life, our greatest obstacle to God, to pursuing Him and enjoying His presence, and it's not something outside of us. It's something within. It's our own sin. That's the greatest problem we have in this broken world, our iniquity. And the guilt that comes with it. This is what the psalmist cries out from in chapter uh, 130. This is what he names in verse 3. He calls it iniquity or sin. Those are the depths from which he cries. That is the, the despair that he's drowning in and from which he calls out for the Lord to have mercy. The recognition of his failure to keep God's law. Lord, I have blown it. I have fallen short. The the guilt of falling short of all that God commands, the shame of wounding others and of offending God's person and throne through our our rebellion, our, our ignorance and waywardness, the dread of sin's consequences, being cut off from God, cut out of the covenant, shut out from his presence. And, and you think of that, that dawning realization of sin, and you think of that in the terms of this journey that he's making. I mean, the whole purpose of this pilgrimage, right, is to go up to Jerusalem to appear before the Lord for worship. And they've made all of the plans, all the packing, all of the arrangements. They've made the trip by God's grace They've navigated all of the dangers of the journey successfully. And and you're finally in Jerusalem. The temple is before you. You are here to seek God's face and to receive his blessing and to, to enter into his presence in joy and praise. And then you remember Psalm 24, 
which describes the kinds of people who are actually welcome into the presence of God. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. And you look at your hands. You consider your heart. You examine your soul and you evaluate your lips and you realize I can't go in there. I can't go in there. And who of us can? I mean, if, if the standard is God's own holiness, if, if any sort of sin is just unfit and unworthy for his presence, who, who among us would be able to stand or enter in? I mean, the reality is that the ancient Israel's problem is... is the exact same problem that we face today. As the, as the prophet Isaiah puts it in, I, in chapter 59, he says, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he cannot hear. And every one of us, that's true for every one of us, we've all messed up in, in, in different ways, right? We have all wounded others and offended God by God's grace, we're not as bad as we could be, right? But nobody's perfect, and that's our problem. Nobody's perfect. No one can go in. So as, as, as bad as things can get in this life, you know, as hard as the situations we face might be, as disappointing and divided as our world is, there's no greater problem than our own personal sin and no greater dread than being separated from the God who made us, from the God who alone can give life and who is life. And so the psalmist, recognizing all of that, being undone by his sin, cries out to God for mercy. And, and his cry is ancient Israel's cry, and our cry as well. So what will the Lord do with that cry? Look again at verses 3 and 4. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. If God should mark iniquities, if he, if he spent his time just kind of watching and waiting for us to mess up, right? He's got his Sharpie in his hand, making his list in permanent ink of all the times we blow it. Sometimes that's what we think God spends his time doing, right? But if that were the way he operated, then we would all be lost, hopelessly lost, right? But that's not all he does. God is holy. I mean, he hates sin. It is an offense against his person and his throne, and, and it does not go unnoticed. But God is not only holy, he is also love. And so therefore, with him, there is forgiveness that he might be feared, that he might be Worshipped and honored above all gods. That's the great promise of this psalm. You know, the God who is holy and who has authority to set his law over the entire universe also has authority to forgive sins when we fall short. That is the great promise of this psalm. That, that the, the debt we incur when, when we blow it God can cancel that. He has the authority to cancel that, to meet us with forgiveness instead. And that has always been the heart of God. That has always been his intention, to redeem a people from himself, for himself. I mean, so often 
And we have this picture that, that God is like some sort of cosmic grouch, just constantly telling us to stay off of his lawn, right? That is so far from the heart of God revealed in the scriptures, from the heart of God revealed in the face of Jesus. He has always been committed to redemption, to redeeming a people for himself, and to dealing with their sins so decisively that it can no longer be charged against them, that it no longer stains or pollutes them, and that it can never again separate them from him. That is his promise of forgiveness. And, and so much of the Old Testament lays the track for the fulfillment of those promises. Or the whole sweeping story of the Old Testament is all moving forward to the fulfillment of this promise. From, from God's declaration clear back in the garden that, that the, the offspring of a woman would crush the head of the serpent to the Passover lamb who dies in place of Israel's firstborn as a substitute, to the priesthood and the sacrifices that, that God gave them for the atonement of their sin, to the promise of a king who will bring justice and salvation to God's wayward people, a king who would sit on David's throne as God's son, who would reign not just on behalf of God, but as God. He would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. A king who would be called Emmanuel. God with us, God right here in our presence. The promise of the incarnation, that, that the creator himself would step into his own creation in order to bring salvation for his people. And, and having dealt then with the biggest problem, I mean, having dealt with our sin, if he can do that, this king is uniquely able then to redeem us from all that sin has messed up. Like if he deals with the main thing, he can deal with the rest of it too, right? And this king will do that. He will bring forth justice and righteousness and renewal. He will make his blessings flow as far as the curse is found. Everything that sin is messed up and destroyed, this king will make it right. He will bring renewal. As, as the psalmist says here in, in verses 7 and 8, for with the Lord... There is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. Not just a little bit of redemption, right? Plentiful, overflowing, more than enough, so much that everything that we long and, and everything we lament over and long to be made right in this world, it will all be answered in this king. That's the promise. That's the promise of Scripture. The promise of our God. And so what, is, what, what did Israel do with that promise? What do we do with it today? Well, look again, look with me at verses 5 and 6. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning. More than watchman for the morning. What did Israel do with the promises of God's redemption? The answer to their cries for mercy. What did they do? They, they waited. They waited with faith and hope. They waited with eager longing and anticipation knowing that their weariness would not last forever, that, that their rescue from the depths was coming. And, and look at the, the way that their waiting is described, right? The, don't miss the repetition there, that more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. Uh, I don't know if you've ever worked a night shift. If you do, you know what it's like to wait for the sun to come up eagerly, Right? Uh, if you're a parent, then you've had some sort of taste of that, 
you know, taking your, your uh, shift on the night duty with a fussy child. I love my babies, but boy, I look forward to the sunrise, right? Um, and, and all the more when your job is guarding a city as a watchman, because that sunrise is not just the end of your shift. It's the relief from all of the stress and anxiety of, of guarding a city, but not being able to see what's coming. The sunrise brings safety, and so you long for it. But no night watchman is as eager for the morning to come as the psalmist is eager for the fulfillment of God's promises. His word of pardon, forgiveness, his acting in history to accomplish salvation for his people. And and as the psalmist waits in verses 5 and 6, so he tells Israel to join him in his waiting in verses 7 and 8. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him there is plentiful redemption. And, you know, for ancient Israel, that hope meant waiting centuries. It meant waiting centuries. I get impatient when I have to wait in a grocery line, right? Like I move around trying to find that one line where there's just only one person in front of me type thing. They waited centuries for the fulfillment of God's promises. They waited through triumph and trial, through victory and defeat, through exile and return, through freedom and occupation. And for most of them, that waiting meant not receiving in their lifetime what was promised. Think about that. The author of Hebrews explains, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. But wait, they did, and faithful God was. As the Apostle Paul describes it in Galatians 4, he says, When the fullness of time had come, when that perfect moment of all history building up to this climactic turn, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Or or as we sang earlier this morning, Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. God kept his word of promise He kept his word of promise, his promise of redemption by sending Christ into this world to be the faithful king that we've always needed. And here's the amazing thing. What what Israel looked forward to with hope, we get to look back on with confidence. We get to look back with with confidence, the, the testimony of Scripture, the eyewitnesses, of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, the testimony of the Spirit in our hearts, we get to look back knowing that what we are preparing to celebrate this week with with Christ's first advent, that, that that arrival changed everything. I mean, you think about why the incarnation Of all the ways God might work his salvation and and, uh, deal with our sin, why in the world did God have to take on flesh? What's that all about? Well, Scripture puts it. In order for someone to step into our place, to represent us truly, they have to become, they have to be like us, right? Jesus had to become truly human if he was going to be a fitting substitute in his life his death, and his resurrection. 
If he's not truly human, he can't be our replacement. And yet, if he's not truly God, he has no ability to save, no power, no authority. And so only someone, only a Savior who is both truly God and truly human at the same time has any ability, authority, or qualification to actually address our sin. And there's only one Savior of whom that is true. And because Jesus took on flesh, became like us in order to save us by offering his life of righteousness for us, taking our sin on the cross and rising to give new life because he has done what he has done and he's done it for us. He is that that perfect savior who's actually qualified to stand in the presence of God. Because of that, there is forgiveness, there is hope, there is new life for all who trust in him. No matter how badly you think you've blown it, no matter how dirty your hands are, how, how infected your heart is, how weary your soul or unclean your lips, if you have Jesus, there is forgiveness and wholeness for you. If you have placed your faith in Christ, no matter whatever the darkness, whatever the shame, the discouragement, the guilt, or the fear, if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, your greatest problem has been decisively dealt with. The greatest problem. Your sin can never be again be charged against you. It can never spoil you it can never separate you from your God. Not if Christ is your Savior and your King. Your greatest problem has been decisively dealt with. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And if God has dealt with our greatest problem, if he's dealt with that one major thing that messes everything else up, well, then, then we can trust him to deal with all the other problems as well, right? Our broken hearts, our broken relationships, our broken bodies, our broken careers, our broken systems, our broken societies. If he can deal with the main thing, we can trust him to deal with all the other things too. And sometimes by his grace, we actually get to see that wholeness happen, right? We get to see God take what sin has destroyed and put it back together. Repentant lives and and, and restored marriages, renewed friendships, renovated hearts. And the Lord, our Lord is not just reconciling us to himself, He's reconciling all things to himself through the cross. He's putting all the mess back together. As Paul says in in Colossians 1, For in Jesus all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That's the power of the cross. It's not just to save us from from our sins penalty, which is amazing, but even from all of the fallout and carnage that sin causes. That's the power of the cross. And, And by God's grace, sometimes we get to see that healing happen, that wholeness, that restoration. And yet sometimes, like Israel of old, we die in faith, not having received what was promised, but only seeing it and greeting it from afar. And so, like Israel of old, again, we too are waiting. We're waiting. Waiting for our Lord to return and to finally and forever put away all sin. Waiting with hope that God will again keep his word 
In Hebrews 9, 28, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who eagerly wait for him. Waiting for the new heavens and new earth wherein righteousness makes its home. That day when our Lord himself will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor pain, nor crying anymore. For the former things have passed away. That's what we are waiting for. Our greatest problem in this weary world is not the, op- the opposition or the circumstances around us, but the sin within us. And God kept his promise to deal decisively with our sin by sending his son into the world. And so we repent. We confess our sin and turn away from it. And we trust, we take hold of Jesus and the forgiveness that he alone can give. And we work, we follow the surprising way of Jesus and shine the light of his kingdom into this dark world. And we wait. We wait for our Lord to return and the renewal of all things. O Israel, hope in the Lord For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Gracious Father, Lord, thank you that we have confidence to wait today because we can look back on your faithfulness yesterday. Lord, as we celebrate the sweet, life-changing beauty of the incarnation of Christ, that day when everything changed because God came down, as we rejoice over that and as we renew our faith and our trust in our Savior, Lord, give us confidence, not only to rest in the finished work of Christ, but to long for and expect his return. Lord, what a glorious day that's going to be. We long for it, we wait, we hope. Keep us faithful in the meantime that your name would be praised. In Jesus' name.